Hey, this is Annie. And Samantha. And welcome to Stuff Mom Never Told You, a production of iHeartRadio's How Stuff Works. This episode was inspired by a recent news story that made the rounds when Vanna White was going to host guest host Wheel of Fortune for three weeks. Mm -hmm. It was all, all over. Um, and it got me thinking about female game show hosts. Which is, a, yeah, which is not very hard of. No. And that's why I immediately looked to make sure no one had done this episode previously because I couldn't really think of any. Right. And there are some, and we're going to talk about them for sure. And if you're not really familiar with Will of Fortune or Vanna White, Vanna White is a household name of course. for a lot of people. Of course. She is the person who flips... The letters, right? Uh, traditionally, she turns them around. Yes, and she's usually in a long cocktail dress. Always, she's been featured in many rap songs. Yes, and <laughs> this isn't the first time um, she's covered for her host Pat Sajak. She has been doing this since 1983. That's about 37 years. Um, once he, he, when he had laryngitis, she stepped in. In interviews, she said about this whole recent guest hosting thing. She was given 30 minutes warning. Before she had to go out and host the whole thing, she described it as pure panic. She once said she does not feel lower than Pat Sajak, but equal to him. And if you're wondering, Wheel of Fortune is the longest-running syndicated game show of all time. So when she was hosting, mm -hmm. was someone else there to flip the letters? Yes. So at first it was, I believe, Mickey and Minnie Mouse. It might have just been Minnie Mouse. Oh, I do remember seeing mm -hmm. those. Okay, yeah. And now it's Pat Sajak's daughter. Or it most recently was Pat Sajak's daughter. Huh. Yeah. And I got to think, I got curious about this. Pat Sajak makes $15 million a I year versus $10 million for Vanna White. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, that's a lot of money. That It's a lot of money, but yeah, that's definitely a big discrepancy. For sure. Are you a big game show person, Samantha? I'm not. I mean, I do have the memories of watching them with my grandparents. I just, I think I'm just too bored and don't like to sit still that like that. But I think the last one I did watch was when my friend actually won on Jeopardy. Oh, wow. Yeah, we had a little viewing party for her and she won. We were like, yeah. I, all I asked was like, where's the money? What are you going to do with that money? <laughs> it took a while for you to get the money. But oh, yeah, interesting. She was able to give me a little behind the scenes, mm -hmm. and it was pretty intense about how they quickly they had to get ready, recording. She had been auditioning for years. Yeah. And she is that person. So if I ever play trivia, I will be taking her with me because she is the random facts girl. For yeah. sure. For sure. Yeah, I was looking at the Jeopardy website doing research for this episode, and I'm definitely going to take the, the test. Oh, are you? You can take the test yeah. on it. I'm not going to do anything after that. I'm just curious. But it is a very well-kept website. And also, Samantha, I don't know if you knew this. Oh, no. I was on high Q. <laughs> Were you? Were you? I remember those Saturday morning <laughs> like competitions. Five a.m. Yeah. Right? <laughs> <laughs> this was a, a high school based trivia show. Right. Pretty much any school can get on there, uh, but I was on there. Well, did you win? Yes. Okay. And there was a question about Michelle Pfeiffer's Catwoman. I actually remember that. Oh, Coming back around. I did not get Coming it. Back the, one of the dudes on the team did. <laughs> of course they did. Yes. Uh, <laughs> I really only ever got into Whose Line Is It Anyway, and I guess Legend of the Hidden Temple, when I, the rare occasion right. when I had access to cable, either through friends or family. Um, and neither of those really count as game shows within the definition that we're using. It's actually more complex than I thought. Mm -hmm. Or not more. Maybe it's just more simple. Yeah. But speaking of, let's let's look at the definition. Right. Basically, it's a televised game with multiple contestants. These contestants are frequently, quote, average people. From Merriam-Webster, a television program on which contestants compete for prizes in a game such as a quiz. Right. Some people include reality shows like So You Think You Can Dance, but that's more of a dance competition, which I really love. A uh, variant of reality competition shows also. So, yeah, I really like those types of shows, but I would not consider those a game show. Like, you can just win prizes. These are people who are talented. 
Right. Okay. It's almost a talent competition. Yeah, 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 as you said. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I got, I was like, well, amazing, right? I kept thinking of all these shows. Right. And then... They're not really game shows in that level. So we're focusing primarily on American television game shows, but we'll be touching on a couple of things outside of that realm. In the early days of televised game shows, lower stake shows aired during the day primarily aimed at housewives, while the higher stake games aired during prime time. And these shows experienced a meteoric rise until several quiz shows were implicated in a series of scandals in 1959, in which producers were giving contestants the answers to up the drama. Yeah. Because you know you got to have that drama. Uh-huh. There was a grand jury and congressional hearing and everything. Panel shows survived the scandal and came out on the other side stronger. Yeah. Weirdly enough. Another thing that helped was a 1954 Supreme Court ruling in FCC versus American Broadcasting Company, Inc., that giveaways weren't gambling, opening the door to bigger prizes. Yeah, this was so interesting. I did not know about this scandal. And there's a there's a movie about it. I think yeah. 1954, yeah, not 19, 1994. Yeah, yeah, um, fascinating. It is. Prior to this scandal, one popular contestant, psychologist Dr. Joyce Brothers, enjoyed widespread popularity after winning the top prize twice on the sixty-four thousand dollar question and the show that replaced it. Once in 1955 and once in 1957. She did this in part by reading 20 encyclopedias about boxing, 20, yep. knowing that she would have a better chance of getting selected as a contestant if she could compete in a novelty category. She beat out actual boxers with her knowledge on obscure rules. The producers of the show didn't like what they called her superficial knowledge of boxing and attempted to oust her by going out of their way to find questions that would stump her. But she won Anyway, oh yeah, they tried to cheat, and you she can't won knock her every down. way. She went on to get her own show where she talked about then taboo topics, sometimes still taboo topics like sexual satisfaction. She guested on several other shows, churned out a few books. She's been in interviews with Conan O'Brien. She is somebody. Yes. <laughs> Suspicion around quiz shows lingered long after this scandal, and when Merv Griffin lamented to his wife about the death of quiz shows and the lack of public trust among the few remaining in 1963, his wife said something along the lines of, why don't you give them the answers? He was concerned the show wouldn't have enough tension, that drama, so she said, why not take the money away? That'll put them in jeopardy, and thus... Jeopardy was born. Yes. So in the wake of the scandal, game shows were relegated to daytime TV in the 60s, but had a comeback in the 70s, but they were pretty low priority in the 80s and 90s for networks. Though the game show network launched in 1994. Game shows are going through a pretty big revival right now, initially sparked by the popularity of the 2002 debut of the American version of Who Wants to Be a Millionaire? I remember. Several are being rebooted for primetime along with the original concepts. And, of course, some shows never went away. Speaking of Jeopardy, this is a 50-plus-year-old show that continues to draw over 20 million viewers a week. The official website claims they get 9 million viewers a week. Right now, they're in the middle of their greatest of all time tournament, which, have you seen the commercials as they're walking, the competitors are oh. walking really dramatically? <laughs> I have not, it, but it's I pretty, don't it's, it's doubt pretty tense. It. Um, Jeopardy and Wheel of Fortune are among our most watched television shows. That kind of blew my mind. It, I mean, just think about the older, well, I guess my grandparents have passed away, but that was one of the traditions that I would walk in and sing uh, Wheel of Fortune. Mm-hmm. And I think it's just an easy going, guess the letter, guess the word. Who doesn't love doing that? You know, I did win $1,000 gambling on the Wheel of Fortune casino game. There's a casino game? I yeah. guess that makes sense. I, I was, I was thinking r- about... You spin it and yeah. Right. I was thinking about all of the different game shows that have turned into, like, home games, you mm-hmm. know, or fl- vice versa. It's kind of interesting to see. Yeah, for sure. Level. I have friends my age that watch Jeopardy regularly. And I always get a get a chuckle when I'm at a bar, and that's what's on the television, right. and people are into it. Right. Again, my friend who was on it, she watched it every. I don't know if she watches it every day, but like she <laughs> no, watched I, it enough to know how this works, the best routes to go, what information, what questions they may be. You know, it's really fun just to see someone who is that dedicated yeah. and loving the show. Yeah. 
Thomas J. Linneman conducted a study called Gender in Jeopardy, Intonation Variation on a Television Game Show, which was really interesting because it looked into uptalk, gender, and jeopardy because in the format of that show, yes, you answer in the form of a question. Yet most people do that with a flat intonation as opposed to the rise at the end of a sentence or a sentence, a rise at the end associated with questions and uptalk. Both men and women were more likely to use uptalk when they answered incorrectly and with uncertainty. Women were far likelier to use uptalk in general, even when answering correctly, almost twice as much as men. Black women were far less likely than white women to use uptalk when correct. The study also found that the more success a woman enjoys, the greater her use of uptalk, perhaps as a way to conform to gender norms. Like women who show off their knowledge are viewed as unfeminine shrews. Viewers may interpret this as women being generally more uncertain and apologetic for success. Men are more likely to use uptalk when correcting a female contestant's incorrect answer, almost double. And the person who conducted the study argues that this is important to talk about because so many people do watch the show, and if kind of the impression we're getting is women are apologetic or wrong, <laughs> um, uncertain, I guess, that that has an impact. And just to uh, clarify, I pro- probably most of you know, but uptalk is the, the practice primarily associated with women of ending phrases and sentences on a higher note. So it's like California Valley Girls is the traditional stereotypical example. Like, My name is Samantha. Hi, my name is Annie. Okay. I do that all the yeah. time. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, like, also kind of a question? Yes. Exactly. So another study found women take fewer risks on game shows. Over the course of Jeopardy's 30-plus seasons, men have earned double the amount of women, despite pretty much the exact same percentage of correct answers. Women wager about half what men do. I would do that, too, honestly. Some other interesting tidbits, about 60% of contestants are male, and the most common category is sports. Other studies have argued that questions askew masculine, and women only won 14% of the time in 2004. In 2014, that number was over 50%. Still, only four women have won six consecutive Jeopardies as opposed to 20 men. Wow. Yeah, that's a lot. Yeah. Game shows made $1.83 billion in ad revenue in 2016, so this is pretty lucrative category. They are generally cheaper and easier to produce. Is it including the... Items that they display, such as Price is Right. Because <laughs> that's an ad in itself. And that's true. Huh. What makes a good game show host? When asked that question, a lot of people say things like confidence, humor, leadership, authority, a lot of things that have been traditionally coded as masculine. However, another popular trait given was generosity or empathy for the guest, which is a very feminine coded thing. Reading the room, essentially. And in in our Dungeons and Dragons campaign as the dungeon master, oh, I feel this. Yeah, we've talked about how powerful you felt. Oh, I do. I feel very powerful, but also you've got to. It cracks me up I, I, that nobody listens to this. Uh, um, I'm not going to kill them unless they do something very terrible. But they're always so scared, and so sometimes I have to, you know, put in a little. It's Mothering. Be okay. <laughs> nurturing. A little bit of nurturing in there. <laughs> yes. So let's talk about numbers. Historically, game show hosts have been men. Surprise, surprise. A rough estimate puts the number of American male game show hosts on television since it was a thing at 230, while women clock in around 23. So there's 10 times 10 more. 10 times more. Yeah. Women do dominate another aspect of game shows, though. One feature of several of these shows are the typically female models who show off the prizes, or in the case of Anna White, flip letters as well. Think Barker's Beauties on The Price is Right from Bob Barker, previous host, Mm -hmm. or Deal or No Deal's 26 models holding suitcases, including at one time Meghan Markle and Chrissy Teigen. Right. Mm -hmm. Deal or No Deal was relaunched in 2018 after a 10-year hiatus. <laughs> After much debate, they did bring back the so called suitcase girls. The message could be read that these beautiful women are there to serve you, that they might make your dreams come true. They do very much seem like beautiful set pieces to be objectified and consumed. And seriously, there's so many examples of this, definitely more than there are female hosts. Most of these models were never even mentioned by name. Carol Merrill, 
of Let's Make a Deal was the first game show model to become a household name thanks to host Monty Hall always referring to her by her full name. According to her, she would receive letters asking if she could even talk to the point they made a joke out of it in their 2000th 500th episode when Meryl finally talked, the gag being she did not stop talking. She kept talking right. and talking and talking. Right. And kind of related, uh, Vanna White's 1987 memoir was entitled Vanna Speaks. Right. I always love the ending, though, when she and, and Pat would say goodbye to the audiences. Uh-huh. And it was, like, surprising to hear her. You're like, oh, oh, hi. Oh, really? Yeah. So another problem, almost all of these models are and have been white women. Kathleen Bradley became the first long-term black game show model on The Price is Right in 1990. 1990. And another problem. Bob Barker and his show were leveled with several sexual harassment and workplace discrimination lawsuits, which Barker denies. Mm -hmm. According to Gwendolyn Osborne Smith, a former Price is Right model, when new host Drew Carey was asked what he wanted the models to be called to replace Barker's beauties during the interview process in 2007, he said, they're not mine. They're their own people, and you can call them by their names. What, what a new found concept. What a good guy. Names. <laughs> by 2010, <laughs> the models were outfitted with mics, and in 2012, the show hired their first male model. Nowadays, they have two. Are they shirtless? Shirtless, shirtless, shirtless? I have no idea. Just, I don't you know. think so. So most of these early games shows also stuck to a strict gender role, meaning that female contestants fought for prizes like cribs or groceries. Mrs. Goes a Shopping or Supermarket Sweep. Yeah. In 2017, Jane Lynch, host of Hollywood Game Night, said that the low numbers of female game show hosts always surprises her. She told Huffington Post... Hollywood Game Night might have started this revival, but there's still no more female hosts. I'm the only one. There's just kind of an inability to open up the mind, I think, to females hosting things. And after I read that quote, I looked up how many women have hosted the Oscars, and uh, not a lot. No, not (laughs) at all. It's like 20 compared to... And usually they're co-hosting with someone. Yeah, yeah. Maybe a future episode. Mm -hmm. Depending on your definition of game shows, she is one of the only women hosting one on network television. Ellen DeGeneres recently joined the fray with Game of Games. And while we are focusing on hosts today, definitely don't want to downplay the women behind the scenes making these shows happen because that is a lot of work without a lot of recognition. But we do have some examples of a famous past female game show host and some present. But first, we have a quick break for a word from our sponsor. Thank you, sponsor. Let's start with Arlene Francis, who regularly featured on the game show What's My Line for 25 years. But that wasn't her only claim to fame. She also worked on her show, Blind Date. Mm. (laughs) Do you know Blind Date? (laughs) I was trying to remember. I know there's a game show where, I don't think this is the one where it was a serial, like we figured out a serial killer. Oh my God. Was on there as a contestant, but I don't think it was a blind date. Oh dear. It was a dating show though. Okay, well, I'll look into that later. (laughs) Uh, Francis previously worked on radio shows, including the 1943 radio iteration of Blind Date, which, as the name implies, is a mash-making show. The show transitioned to the new and rising medium of television in 1949, and Francis continued her role as host, becoming television's first ever female game show host here in the United States. However, she didn't stick around very long. A male host took over for her in 1952, But her success opened the door for her to appear on What's My Line, and she secured another first soon after when she was cast on the variety show Your Show of Shows, becoming the first female MC or FEMC. Ew. Yeah, that's what what she was referred to. She returned to radio in 1961, launching the Arlene Francis Show, which aired until 1990, all while appearing on television. And... We got to talk about Betty White. I didn't know she was going to come up. I had no idea she was a host. I didn't either, but from the 1950s to the 1980s, Betty White guested on all sorts of game shows, enough so she was nicknamed the first lady of game shows. Pyramid, password, to tell the truth, she even took over hosting from Jean Rayburn for a round during one of her appearances on Match Game. She started hosting her own show in 1983 called Just Men with an exclamation mark. Yeah, it's for me. Like I thought you were talking about the hair product. Just for men. <laughs> no. Okay, Just Men. Just got Men. It. Just got it. 
Two female contestants would face off uh, to claim the prize, which was a car. The men on Just to Men came in the form of seven male celebrities. The female contestants had to guess how these male celebrities would answer to yes or no questions. And if the female contestant was right, the male celebrity would give the contestant a key that might, might belong to the car up for grabs. For her work on this show, White won the Daytime Emmy for Outstanding Game Show Host, the first woman to do so, beating out Dick Clark and Richard Dawson. However, the show is short-lived, ending the same year it began after only 65 episodes due to low viewership. I, I can't say I've ever heard of that game. Nope, me either. So after her stint as a Playboy buddy, and I, because I, I remembered this game show yeah, really, you really this clearly, one was Jenny McCarthy, went on, who went on to co-host MTV's Singled Out, which, by the way, oh my God. It sounds so problematic. Yeah, it really sounds like it was. <laughs> when you start thinking about it, at that point, it was the 90s. It was when they were going to the beach house and everything was sexy and cool and fun. And, right. and you just wanted to be a part of that. And you're like, oh, she's so cool. Right. Uh, which was like, again, a sort of a guess who like dating game. Mm-hmm. And she was super handsy, raunchy, and gross. And apparently that was one of the, like, the things that she had talked about later when she was being interviewed about the show and the experiences was the fact that she was like, I'm tired of being objectified. My turn. Oh. Essentially, and she just went all in. They gave her permission to be that absurd, so she went again all in. <laughs> so uh, apparently, it's being rebooted to encompass all genders and sexual preferences. Yeah, I wonder if it's going to include Jenny McCarthy or not. I don't think so. Almost every show we're mentioning is actually in the process of being rebooted. Right, right. Uh, fascinating. I don't. I don't think she came up in when I was reading the press release about it. I don't know if people are going to really be down for Jenny McCarthy and her no. anti-vaccine stances. Yeah, I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> in the 90s, also in the 90s, two-time Olympic swimming gold medalist Summer Sanders became Nickelodeon's first female game show host on Figure It Out, also being rebooted. She has said she is interested. She said she found out about this on Twitter oh. and is interested in coming back and yeah, guesting course. on it. Yeah, and then I remember this. In 2001, The Weakest Link. Oh, you didn't say it right. The Weakest Link. <laughs> Thank you for that correction. <laughs> Premiered in the United States, which was this was the U.S. version of a British show. It was hosted by Anne Robinson, the U.K.'s, quote, queen of mean. And the saying, you are the weakest link, goodbye, was all the rage for a while. And... Despite the catchy slogan, the show only lasted two seasons, but it felt like a long time. Right. It, it really, really did. did. <laughs> like, I feel like it was on every sitcom Yeah, in that time frame. Yeah, I read a lot of essays about this in particular, and was it uh, basically uh, promoting the, the view of women as, like, shrews and mean and bitchy? It kind of did. I, I, Yeah, I guess so. I just remember it being, like, a harsh school marm type uh, of thing. Yeah. So, Brooke Burns accepted the gig of hosting GSN's The Chase in 2013, and she hosted a couple of others. I can't remember all of them, but I do know I've yeah. seen her doing Around. her, her yeah. thing. Um, and also, she is a former Baywatch cast member. Did not know that. Yeah. 22 years after Betty White's historic win, Meredith Vieira won an Emmy for Outstanding Game Show Host for Who Wants to Be a Millionaire, which she took over hosting duties from Regis Philbin and moved it to... Uh, from primetime to daily syndication, she hosted for 11 years. Wow, I didn't realize it was that long. Yeah. She won a second Emmy for Outstanding Game Show Host and trailblazed for women in the game show world in another way by co-executive producing 365 episodes. Okay. Kim Coles became the first black woman to host a primetime game show with Pay It Off in 2009. And for those who are really jazzed still about daytime game shows, Leslie Jones just signed to be the new host for Supermarket Sweep, which we talked about being really, really um, kind of misogynistic a little bit or very sexually. I mean, yeah, if it's all women and, well, we'll see. We'll see. I'm sure Leslie won't let that happen, (laughs) Um, which has already been launched in the UK. And the contract process apparently took a long time and it was a whole bidding war for the different networks to get it. So supermarket sweep is like you have a cart and right. you're trying you to have throw to, stuff you, in You it. and a partner have to get a certain amount. I honestly don't know. <laughs> I just remember, I remember seeing, seeing them it. in T-shirts, matching T-shirts, uh-huh. getting ready to go with their carts, and then just scrambling through and like, I don't know Throwing if they're trying to like. Paper. Yeah, I don't know if they're trying I to think get it was value-based. or something. Okay. I thought it was value-based. I want it to be like um, a top chef level of you've got 30 minutes to do this, but you only have five minutes to do this. Mm-hmm. 
But, you know, that's kind of funny because we were talking about this before we started rolling, how a lot of American game shows are seen as too competitive right. and loud right. uh, for other, for international markets, which I find very funny. You know, we did talk about the fact when you look at um, some of the UK mm-hmm. game shows, it's very calm. Which is relaxing. Because if Anne Robinson from the Linkus Link is the example we have, but uh, everybody tells me about the great British Bake Off, that they're so right. nice, and that's why they like it. And then it. I researched and told you they only get flowers as where And recognition. And recognition, <laughs> yes. But like if you do, as we were talking about Top Chef, mm-hmm. 125000 in each game, each uh, episode, you probably want either a car or 10000 extra dollars or a trip to Spain, mm-hmm. trip to Italy. So it's kind of giant amounts of mm-hmm. money. Yeah. But to be fair, I think they have more sponsors. If you oh. watch British Bake Off versus Top Chef, like oh. Top Chef is like yeah. sponsored by Serene Rep people. I can't remember, but glad. you know, Glad, yes. There you go. A lot of Glad things uh-huh. happening. Recently, it used to be Toyota, and uh-huh. the n- newest episodes or the newest season that I watched was BMW. So oh, whoa. It, yeah, it, it went up pretty yeah. significantly. Sure. Well, that is a world I... We'll probably research, even though I don't have time to do anything else right. but work right now, but, but I'll probably do it. Fun. We do have one more thing we want to talk about when it comes to women in game shows. But first, we have one more quick break for a word for our sponsor. And we're back. Thank you, sponsor. Before we close out, we did want to touch on something called the Monty Hall problem. Mm. So imagine this scenario. You are on a game show with three doors. Behind one of the numbered doors is a new car. (laughs) Behind the other two, goats. You choose door number one. The host, Monty, who knows what's behind all the doors, opens door number two, revealing a goat. Then he asks you if you want to switch doors. What do you do? Well, this might seem like a simple thing. Most people would say it's 50-50. It doesn't really matter. But there are whole books that have been written about this. And if you're wondering why we're talking about it, we've got to talk about Marilyn Voss Savant, a child prodigy born in Missouri in 1946. Seriously, the Guinness Book of World Records awarded her for having the world's highest IQ. And she was known as the world's smartest woman. Perhaps worth noting, she does not think the IQ test necessarily is a good measure of IQ. But she's smart. (laughs) She's very smart. Right, right. Parade Magazine offered her a full-time gig, and she created a column called Ask Marilyn, which was a weekly column where people could write in with academic questions or puzzles, and she would answer them. A reader wrote in about the Monty Hall problem, basically... Given that scenario that we just discussed, should you switch doors? She answered it in her column, probably thinking nothing of it, just another day (laughs) answering this question. And yeah, while most people assume it doesn't really matter because your chances are now 50-50, it's actually better to switch. Uh, There's a one-third chance of winning by staying with the same door and a two-thirds chance of winning if you switch, she politely explained. Then came over... 10,000 letters claiming she was stupid, several from scholars and PhDs. She was called names and assailed with gender stereotypes. Here's a taste of some of the letters she received. Again, world's smartest woman providing the correct answer. And also, shout out to Priceonomics for this roundup of letters. Example number one. You blew it, and you blew it big. Since you seem to have a difficulty grasping the basic principle at work here, I'll explain. After the host reveals a goat, you know you have one in two chances of being correct. Whether you change your selection or not, the odds are the same. There is enough mathematical illiteracy in this country, and we don't need the world's highest IQ propagating more. Shame! Exclamation point. From Scott Smith, PhD at the University of Florida. And here's another. May I suggest that you obtain and refer to a standard textbook on probability before you try to answer a question of this type again? From Charles Reed, PhD, University of Florida. That's two for Florida. Mm -hmm. So here's one from Georgia State University. I'm sure you will receive many letters on the topic from high school and college students. Perhaps you should keep a few addresses for help with future columns. W. Robert Smith, PhD. 
You are utterly incorrect about the game show question, and I hope this controversy will call some public attention to the serious national crisis in mathematical education. If you can admit your error, you have contributed constructively towards the solution of a deplorable situation. Oh. How many irate mathematicians are needed to get you to change your mind? <laughs> <laughs> From E. Ray Bobo. <laughs> That's fantastic. So, another one. You made a mistake. But look at the positive side. If all those PhDs were wrong, the country would be in some very serious trouble. Everett Harmon, PhD, U.S. Army Research Institute. You are the goat! (laughs) (laughs) From Glenn Calkins, Western State College. I love that emphasis. Thank you for that. Mm -hmm. Oh, absolutely. Maybe women look at math problems differently than men. From Don Edwards in Sun River, Oregon. So... Condescending, and if you'll notice, all men. All from men. Ta-da! <laughs> In the fallout, she wrote three more columns about the Monty Hall problem to prove that she was correct. Even over a year later, people still doubted her, insulted her, and questioned her intelligence, of course. And one man <laughs> wrote in, I still think you're wrong. There's no such thing as a female logic. <laughs> Well, sure. sure. So if you're a female and you have logic or any I type know. of thinking skill, <laughs> yes. Sure. <laughs> sure. Thanks for that. Yes. This did change over the years, this kind of backlash, especially as computer models were built that showed she was correct. <laughs> it took computers. It took computers. A lot of these academics wrote in and admitted that they had been wrong. Mm. But, yeah, it took a computer for people to believe the so-called smartest woman in the world and all of this condescending, insulting, and almost triumphant nature in their responses is very telling about how we view women's intelligence, competence, and authority, especially in traditionally masculine fields like math. Right. Yeah, and um, if people write in to tell us we're wrong about this, I'm going to break something. (laughs) Yes. And this is still a topic that is debated in the academic community. Really, it seriously is. Although largely in terms of host psychology. Right, as it should be talking about the idea of mansplaining in general, as we talked before. And I think what we're going to do if we do get some more um, (laughs) conversations... About the Monty Hall problem. Uh, yeah, and and that you're wrong or that we're wrong. Um, we're going to have a giant breaking everything party. Yeah. And we'll Get ready, it. I heart. Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> this is our, our warning to our boss. We're going to rage. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I, I seriously, I did read the current arguments around it. And some of them espouse essentially what she was saying is correct, but for the wrong reasons. Oh, okay. That's the that's the way to clarify. She's still wrong. She's she still might be wrong. right, but she's still wrong. You know, that's the the tightrope that we walk. Of course, of course, <laughs> of course. But that's what we have to say about women and game shows in this really fascinating, surprisingly fascinating world of game shows. It's a big door. It is. And if you have been through that door, either working on one or competing right. on one, or if you just have any game show stories. Please send them to us. I really, really enjoyed all the research for this one. You can email us at stuffmediamomstuff at iheartmedia.com. You can find us on Twitter at momstuffpodcast or on Instagram at stuff I've never told you. Thanks as always to our missing super producer, Andrew, Andrew Howard. Andrew, he left us for a meeting. Horrible. Just horrible. And thanks to you for listening. Stuff I'm Never Told You is a production of iHeartRadio's How Stuff Works. For more podcasts from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows. 